to do a, here we go, a land acknowledgement. Uh, for millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been part of this land that SDSU sits on. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumeyaay. So I want to thank um, all of the people who have made this possible, uh, this event possible. In particular, I want to thank the School of Public Affairs who supported the funding to screen the film and have this uh, film screening available to students and all other interested people for a week. Uh, I also want to thank the Women's Studies Department, the Women's Resource Center, the Center for Transformative Justice, Women Who Make Movies, uh, our interpreters and our captioners. Um, and as um, uh, mentioned, I especially thank uh, Celine Joseph and just Dr. Jess Watcott for making this event come together. Um, so I'd like to also introduce our panelists for today. The first panelist that the, uh, to introduce is Erica Cohn, um, the director of the film Belly of the Beast. Erica Cohn is a Peabody, Emmy, and DJA award-winning filmmaker who was recognized by Variety as one of the 10 documentary filmmakers to watch in 2017. Most recently, Erica directed, produced The Judge and co-directed, produced In Football We Trust, Belly of the Beast, a New York Times critics pick is her third feature documentary. I'd next like to induce, uh, to introduce Lorena Garcia Zermeno, from California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. Lorena Garcia Zermeno is the Policy and Communications Coordinator for California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. She spent the last two years leading CLRJ's policy advocacy efforts, which included co-sponsoring AB 1007 and the companion budget request to secure reparations for survivors of state-sponsored forced sterilizations in California. I'd next like to introduce Dr. Jess Watcott, Dr. Jess Watcott, they, them, is an assistant professor of women's studies and LGD, LGBTQ plus studies at SDSU. They research early 20th century eugenics policies in California and how eugenics continues in prisons and other carceral sites in the present. And finally, I'd like to welcome Dr. Erica Redner Vera. Dr. Erica Redner Vera is an assistant professor of criminal justice in the School of Public Affairs at San Diego State University. Prior to joining SDSU, Dr. Redner Vera was a visiting assistant professor in the sociology department at the University of Montana and a faculty associate in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Arizona State University. Dr. Redner Vera's research interests include race, ethnicity, crime, and justice, especially issues concerning American Indians. She is a 2021 Fellow of the Racial Democracy, Crime, and Justice Network and a 2015 Graduate Research Fellow of the Bureau of Justice Statistics, where her dissertation examined the treatment of American Indian defendants in United States federal courts. And so I thank and welcome all of the panelists today, and I'm looking forward to a really fantastic conversation and discussion about uh, all of these issues present in the film and their expansion beyond. So I'd love to begin um, with Ms. Cohn. I'd love to hear and understand the inspiration and your experiences in producing Belly of the Beast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be on this panel today. So I started Belly of the Beast um, 11 years ago. Uh, a mutual friend actually introduced me to attorney Cynthia Chandler, who's featured in the film. And I was incredibly inspired by Cynthia's compassionate release work. She was the first attorney in California to get someone out of prison under compassionate release. And I was also very inspired by the organization that she co-founded, Justice Now, as you see in the film, which was the only organization in the country that had board members who are currently incarcerated, really informing strategy and informing policy from the inside out as opposed to the outside in, which is how so many organizations work in this space. And they had a campaign called the Let Our Families Have a Future campaign, which essentially exposed the multiple ways that prisons destroy the basic fundamental human right to family. One of the most heinous, of course, being the illegal sterilizations, primarily targeting women of color. And immediately to me, the screamed eugenics. You know, as a Jewish woman, the phrase never again was always in the back of my mind. 
And when I learned about this different kind of genocide that was happening through imprisonment in general, and more specifically through forced sterilizations behind bars, I knew that I wanted to get involved some way, somehow. And initially that was as a volunteer. Cynthia invited me into the organization where I later became a volunteer legal advocate providing direct services for over 150 people inside California's women's prisons. And from there, really in collaboration with folks inside, began a project that would ultimately become Belly of the Beast. And the initial kind of inception of this idea was to really chronicle the incredible human rights documentation work that was happening peer to peer inside prison and how that information was really funneled out through this incredible underground network of activists because of course the prison didn't want this information getting out. And so you see this kind of activism that Kelly really instigates inside prison in, in the film. That all changed when I met Kelly. I had the privilege to meet Kelly a couple of years into the process. And I had heard about Kelly's powerful activism through um, many folks inside and through my work at Justice Now, but it was a pretty incredible moment, kind of a, a little bit starstruck moment when I had the uh, um, opportunity to meet her. At the time she was working in Los Angeles doing the incredible domestic violence prevention work and gang intervention work that she does and was not interested in telling her story but really wanted to be involved in the film behind the scenes. And so she became a creative advisor working behind the scenes with me to really figure out a way, a mechanism to place audiences into the world in which the film would um, be unfolding. And a couple of years into that process, as you see in the film, the Center for Investigative Reporting released their very controversial findings on the tubal ligations that were happening in California's women's prisons during labor and delivery. And all of a sudden, there was this tremendous momentum, this potential, this national conversation, potential for legislation. And that was the moment that Kelly really got called back into the movement. The movement needed her to testify on behalf of so many people who otherwise would not be able to testify. And that was the moment that Kelly and I decided that we would begin filming her up until the point that she testified. And the more and more we filmed, it became so abundantly clear that the film really needed to center around her story being the catalyst to begin this investigation in the first place, if it wasn't for Kelly's courage and selfless advocacy for her to not only uncover what happened to her, but also to investigate what happened to others and move forward and expose that and you know, take her case to trial, we wouldn't even be here today. There wouldn't be a film, there wouldn't have been the Center for Investigative um, Reporting's work. Um, and, uh, there wouldn't potentially be the reparations um, that we now have for survivors of forced sterilization in California. Thank you so much for that, that background, for understanding where you're coming from um, with the film and also Kelly's involvement. Um, and you speak about reparations. And so the film leaves us before reparations have, have um, been determined. Can you speak to what that current status is now? Yeah, absolutely. So, for those who don't yet know, reparations for sterilization survivors in California has recently passed. And um, as you come to understand through the film that Black, Indigenous, Latinx, incarcerated people, people with disabilities, people living in poverty have all been disproportionately targeted for sterilizations. And this victory is a huge step for California in confronting this heinous eugenics history. Um, as you also see in the film, you know, between 1909 and 1979, California sterilized at least 20,000 people under the eugenics, state eugenics program. And so this um, reparations uh, movement, which um, Lorena can speak more to kind of all, everything it took to get to this point in 2021 to finally have reparations pass, um, compensation will be provided to both historic survivors as well as um, modern day survivors who were sterilized in California's women's prisons. 
And California now is the first state to provide notification of core sterilization and reparation to survivors who were sterilized recently or um, in the modern era while also incarcerated um, in its state's women's prisons. And I think it's important to know that a lot of people still to this day don't know they were sterilized. So this notification process is absolutely essential. Um, and we're currently working with the Victims Compensation Board to ensure that that process is trauma-informed um, and done with guidance of survivors. California is now also the third state to provide monetary compensation to historic survivors who were sterilized um, according to the eugenics laws um, following in the footsteps of uh, North Carolina and Virginia. So this is a very historic moment and a very historic year. That's so incredible to hear. And Lorena, I can't wait to hear your views on that as well. Um, uh, I would love to understand a little bit more from your perspective about what the next steps are after this film has, has its completion, though it leaves us um, wondering you know, how, how people will be restored and how the system will be re re repaired and reformed. What are some of the next steps that, that exist for this particular um, story? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that. This has been um, an incredible journey um, for Cynthia and for Kelly. You know, it's been over 20 years and for um, people who have been kind of along doing this, doing this work. Um, and to finally see that reparations has passed, and that's a huge part of where we're at right now, is a part of the larger kind of broader picture of how we need to hold our institutions and state actors who have committed these harms accountable and in order to really prevent future abuses from happening. So I think in this moment, it is so key that California do this right and California do this in a trauma-informed way to provide a model for other states across the country um, and hopefully um, at a federal level as well. We saw recently, you know, last fall, pretty much a year ago, um, actually we're on the year anniversary of the sterilization of um, people inside the Irwin um, County Detention Center in Georgia and all the ramifications that the courageous whistleblower Don Wooten experienced after coming forward with um, the allegations of the mass hysterectomies. So we know this is not unique to California. According to all of our reporting that we did alongside the film, um, we know that at least eight other states allow for sterilizations um, in prison under certain uh, circumstances. So um, we hope this creates a ripple effect. Thank you so much for your thoughts on that and for the backstory about um, how these things come to play and where, where, they're going, where we think they're going to be headed. Um, I know we'll circle back to additional questions for you, Ms. Cohn, but um, I'm gonna transition over to Dr. Watcott, who um, has some additional background, some additional history as part of their work um, in the, the eugenics movement in California. And so I will pivot over and ask uh, Dr. Watcott to share uh, some of this history with the panel um, to, to elicit some further discussion. Yeah, thank you so much for making this film. And I also, I feel really honored to be on the panel with um, everybody that's here today. I feel like I'm stand, standing in the room with giants. Um, but I, I first learned about uh, the sterilizations in California prisons uh, several, uh, I guess about a decade ago. <laughs> Uh, when I was doing prisoner solidarity work with people at Pelican Bay State Prison and a friend of mine was interning at Justice Now and um, told me about, about what was happening in California women's prisons. And uh, I remember the friend said, it's eugenics all over again. And I, first of all, didn't know what eugenics was. Um, and I didn't know that California had a long history of eugenics, state-sponsored eugenics policies. And so that eventually led me on my path of the dissertation research that I did and, and the research that I do now. So for those folks in the room who don't know what eugenics is or uh, about California's history of eugenics, I just wanted to do a quick um, overview and also not take up too much time since I know we have some great panelists here who 
uh, can share a lot more. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, potentially, this is it. Oh, I don't think it's gonna allow me to share my screen. That's okay. So, um, you know, this term eugenics comes from uh, this, this person, Francis Galton. He, he coined the term in 1883 uh, and he described it as the science which deals with all influences that improve the inborn qualities of a race um, and develop them to the utmost advantage. Um, what nature does blindly, slowly, and ruthlessly, man may do providently, quickly, and kindly. And so he emphasized this idea of breeding humans to, you know, expand the quote unquote good stock and to prevent the quote unquote bad stock from uh, reproducing. He had many racist ideas about who he considered to be good and bad stock. And he also specifically targeted uh, people that he considered to be criminals, um, as well as people he considered to be feeble-minded uh, as those who needed to be prevented from having children. So a lot of scholars, even though Francis Galton coined this term, Many scholars like Dorothy Roberts have pointed out that these kinds of ideas go much further back. Um, Dorothy Roberts traces them to the practice of slavery in the United States and the transatlantic slave trade um, and the breeding of human beings. Um, and also these ideas go back to the conquest of the Americas by Europeans and settler colonialism. Um, and ideas about who was superior and, and deserved to, you know, take over the earth. So even though that's where, even though Galton coined those terms, these ideas do go much, much further back and are rooted in much longer histories of oppression. Um, once Galton coined this term, it, it became very popular. Uh, we had the establishment of uh, national and international eugenics associations who, uh, which included many ups, you know, upstanding, educated uh, leaders uh, in uh, the communities. Many um, of women activists and organizers in the early 20th century, which is one of the things I'm studying now, believed eugenics and promoted eugenics ideas. And these were the women that were you know, uh, starting the juvenile court system, opening homes for unwed mothers, um, doing, uh, you know, this, this good work uh, of establishing the field of social work, um, early uh, psychologists all believed in these ideas and called themselves eugenicists and promoted these ideas. Um, even, even eugenics ideas show up in the work of scholars like W.E.B. Du Bois, um, the president of the United States, a lot of people considered themselves to be eugenicists and promoted these ideas. In California, um, eugenics was very popular. Uh, the, the co-founders of Stanford University were eugenicists. Um, you know, many, many leaders uh, in, in California were, were eugenicists. If you would like to read more about it, there's a great book, and I can put it in the chat by uh, Alex Stern called Eugenics Nation, where she, she tells a lot of this history of eugenics in California. Um, one of the eugenics policies, which we'll focus on today, was called the Asexualization Law. It was first passed in 1909. It was one of the first of its kind in the United States. And it actually con uh, operated all through um, in until the, the 1970s when it was repealed. So many people have heard about um, the, the um, Bell v. Buck Supreme Court decision in 1928, which um, you know, basically made it legal for states to have 
state-sponsored eugenics programs. Um, and many states passed new laws after that court decision. But California's was in operation all up until that 1928 decision. And so um, people were being sterilized uh, from 1909 through um, things kind of petered off in the 1950s due to some court, some state court decisions. Um, but the law wasn't overturned until 1978. Um, and then many folks have probably heard about the reason why the law was overturned. And that was because of another court case called Madrigal v. v. Killigan, which uh, had to do with the sterilization of women who were giving birth at LA County Hospital um, in the mid 1960s and early 1970s. And they were being sterilized without their consent some cases they were being similar to the film, you know, being asked to sign a form while they are in active labor, uh, you know, not being offered information or materials only in English when that was not their primary language. Um, uh, all, all kind of, there are instances of, of actual violence being physical violence uh, against uh, those women. So 10, Actually, 10 brave women came forward and participated in a class action lawsuit against LA County Hospital. The judge in that case said a lot of similar things to the doctor in the film about how sterilization was saving the state money by preventing uh, Latino women from reproducing and inevitably, um, you know, needing to go on welfare or do things that were going to cost the state money. So the judge in that case actually said a lot of similar things to the early eugenicists and to the doctor in the case that we're talking about today. And so those that that class and those uh, plaintiffs in that case did not win their lawsuits, but they did appeal to the state of California to overturn the original asexualization law. And so that's why the case was overturned. Um, so that's just a little bit of, of background to the sterilizations that happened in the California Department of Corrections. Um, probably, um, probably since the 1990s, um, it, it's, what we know is it's probably longer than just the period covered by the um, legislative analysts report. Um, which just covered the years 2006 to 2010, but there's a lot of evidence that this was happening much longer in California Department of Corrections facilities. Um, and uh, so I, I guess I just wanna leave with that the, these things keep happening over and over again. Um, and I'm so grateful that we have the legislation that was passed in 2014 that says that um, people cannot be sterilized for the purposes of birth control in um, California prisons. I'm so grateful for the reparations bill. Um, I remain concerned about the ways that eugenics ideas circulate, particularly among health providers. And I think that it's going to take us challenging those, I those broader ideologies um, doing medical provider education uh, in particular, um, but also just general public education um, to, to prevent this from happening again so that people can unlearn those ideas that it's okay to take away some people's rights um, in the name of some greater good. Thank you so much for that background, Jess. I, I mentioned to you the other day that this history of eugenics is something that I as a trained criminologist also did not have enough knowledge about. And so I'm really grateful for your background. One of the things that you just discussed um, and that is just clear and jaw dropping in the film is these conversations or justifications by medical providers for performing these sterilizations. This idea that oh, well, let's just do this now and we're going to save the, save the state money. We're going to prevent a welfare state. We're going to, you know, it has, it has these trappings of 
producing some kind of you know, savings or cost benefit analysis. Can you speak a little bit to that particular issue and then also you know, how, those, how those types of um, justifications play out at present? Yeah, so let me say first, sorry, I need to turn my light on. It keeps turning off. Um, that's a total red herring by um, that, that people would say that this is somehow going to save money because the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation is a massive, um, a massive institution that causes the state billions of dollars every year. And so to say that, um, you know, somehow money is going to be saved by taking away this person's autonomy over their body and telling them that the state knows best or, or that a medical provider knows what is best for them to do uh, uh, around having a family um, is, uh, just a complete distraction from the the actual political economy of corrections um, in in the United States, and I think that it it's something it's a it's a strategy that's been used for a long time, going back I would say to the 1980s, with the idea of you know the welfare queen who is having too many children and costing the state a lot of money and therefore we need to um, we need to reform our entitlement programs and take away you know people's right to a basic income um, in order to save money. Meanwhile, governments are spending billions of dollars on nuclear weapons, war machines, building a huge prison industrial complex, um, criminalizing migrants, building border walls, um, just investing a lot of uh, technology in war, destruction, violence, and control. And so I think that that's, first of all, it's just, it's just a, a total distraction from the actual economics of how, of how things are run. And it's a way to create moral panic among, among us so that people are focused on um, the lives of women of color um, and scapegoating Black, Indigenous, you know, Latina, uh, you know, Asian women of color, women of uh, Asian descent, Pacific Islanders. And uh, you know, focusing us on controlling these people's lives um, so that we're not paying attention to these other um, structural problems in our society and actual solutions. Yeah, thank you so much for illuminating on that. I think your connections for the audience about these ideas to moral panics helps kind of better explain how all of those people, I'm just, I'm just like uh, imagining all of those Facebook comments coming up in the, the way that they were um, presented in the film is just jarring, just completely jarring about the way that people feel about other, other individuals. Um, thank you so much for that, um, Dr. Watcott. I mean, we're gonna circle back to some of those ideas, but I'd love to talk to uh, or hear from um, Ms. Garcia Zermania about um, some of the work that the California um, Latinas for Reproductive Justice are doing, um, but also maybe beginning with talking about your work and relationship to the current reparations bill. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for having me here in this uh, really great discussion on um, eugenics and the um, incredible work that everybody has been doing. Uh, so for CLRJ, um, you know, I really wanted to first kind of uh, provide some details on what is included in the bill, right? So um, some logistics. Uh, in this summer, um, we were able to secure uh, $4.5 million to provide the forced sterilization compensation program in California. And um, I wanted to really uplift 
the incredible work of our coalition um, to really advance this work and to secure um, reparations. And so um, with that, I wanted to highlight a few of the organizations that really co-sponsored, right, and, and were integral to this work. Um, of course, uh, the in incredible role of the film, My Belly of the Beast, in really creating that culture shift work that was so incredibly important. Um, and really the film was an incredibly powerful tool as we were really doing our legislative advocacy work um, this past year specifically, but even having um, advanced access to the film last year, which was something really amazing that we were able to do. Um, and then I really wanted to also highlight, you know, of the folks that worked on this, um, we had the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, um, the amazing research from the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab that came from the University of Michigan, specifically Dr. Alexandra Nina Stern and um, Dr. Nicole Novak that were really critical in um, ensuring that we even had the data and the research to make a case for the eugenics population in California. Um, and to be able to bring that forth um, as, as legislation. Um, and then the work of um, the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, who are also co-sponsors of this legislation. And of course, um, Kelly Dillon's role um, with uh, Back to the Basics Community Empowerment, being a co-sponsor of this as well. And so for us, we actually um, used a, a dual strategy, right? So we introduced, um, legislation over the past four years, you maybe have um, heard it being referred to different numbers. Um, the la last year it was AB 3052, this year it was AB 1007. Um, and this is legislation that was authored by assembly member Wendy Carrillo. And then the last two years, we not only introduced legislation, but we also um, were running a budget request. So using two tracks to achieve our hopeful um, end goal, right? Which was to secure the funding and include the policy to make this happen. And so we're very grateful that this year um, through a number of reasons, which I can get into right now, but um, we were able to um, secure the, the funding through the budget request in June. Uh, which means that essentially um, AB 1007 um, wasn't so needed, right? So when we talk about this, for us, it was really important to make that distinction as we were doing our, our legislative um, advocacy work. Um, and so for us, what that means is that between now and um, when the policy part of this officially starts being um, you know, implemented in the beginning of the year, our coalition has been working um, really, really intensely on the implementation and um, wanting to highlight the fact that in the policy, um, there's two particular populations, like Erica mentioned in the beginning, that actually are eligible and would be would qualify to receive reparations under this particular program. The first being survivors of forced sterilizations that were sterilized. Um, between 1909 and 1979 under California eugenics laws, and then subsequently would be survivors that were sterilized while incarcerated in California women's prison post-1979. Um, and so really uplifting the fact that this is, um, you know, we know as a coalition, we know that this does not encompass the totality of individuals that have been sterilized in different institutions, right? And we wanna be very clear about that. So um, for us, it took an incredible amount of work to have the data through the audit, through the incredible work of Kelly Dillon and the team behind Belly of the Beast and the researchers behind, you know, the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab to have the data to make a case for state-sponsored for sterilization specifically. But we know that our, work is not over, right? We know that there's still a lot more to do to um, be able to provide reparations to individuals that were sterilized, as just mentioned, in county hospitals, for example, um, in you know, LA County USC is one, one example, right? But we, we know there's a lot of work to do to uncover the extent of that, because while that is one particular um, county hospital that has been very much highlighted through the work of the Madrigal case um, and the documentary film Mamas Bebes, 
that's one of many counties in the state, right? And so um, just to uplift the fact that, you know, we know that the work isn't over and that while this is a really incredible win, um, there's still so much work to do. Um, and, you know, for us as a coalition, what was really imperative and critical is that we continue to uplift, uplift the connections between eugenics and eugenics ideology um, and how it's deeply entrenched in systems of um, inequities that continue to impact our communities to this day, right? And, and I know folks have already mentioned in different ways in the call. Um, and for, for CLRJ specifically, you know, what for me, what was really um, think powerful about the coalition that we had and that we really pushed this forward while we had our co-sponsors, co right? That really were the ones, um, we were the ones that were, you know, weekly called and making sure that this was moving forward. We had a much broader coalition that really supported um, our legislative advocacy work of over 60 organizations or that, that did a lot of work um, in terms of doing the legislative visits, um, doing the education that, that we needed to do um, to our state legislators to have them be aware of this issue. You know, one of the things that we constantly encountered over the last four years of trying to get this through was, um, you know, when we would hear a lot of shock from legislators. So we'd, we'd hear people say, we thought eugenics was something of the past. We thought that's something that, you know, happened a long time ago. And we heard, a, we had a lot of questions like, well, why is this relevant now? Like, why should we be investing these millions of dollars to establish this program now? Um, and for us, it was really important that we uplifted that and, and we kept pushing that we know that this isn't something that just happened a long time ago. We know that forced sterilizations continue to happen um, and that we need to address and hold the state accountable, like um, Erica mentioned, right? It was about the accountability piece to really make sure that this conversation is being censored um, as we're trying to push forward conversations of equity, of health equity, um, and reproductive justice, and racial justice, and gender justice, um, and disability justice. And, and for us, like as a coalition that works at the intersection of all of these different issues, that was you know, very critically important. And then something else that I really wanted to uplift was um, you know, for CRJ specifically, um, you know, we are a statewide policy advocacy organization, but we are based in Los Angeles. And um, you know, as we were doing this work, we've um, in our policy advocacy work, CLRJ has really focused on um, you know, work around eugenics for a, a really long time, right? predating my, my role at CLRG, um, definitely. But one of the things that I remember in like the six years that I've been here is as we were doing outreach in our community, informing them of our efforts, right? And with, with this bill, um, different iterations of this bill. Um, and as we were out in, in different communities of Southeast Los Angeles and in the Central Valley as well, um, as we were talking about eugenics and forced sterilizations, this issue being constantly something that people in our communities would relate to, which was very, um, you know, it's very telling, right? That on the one hand, you have, you know, our state legislature having different ideas of eugenics. And then when you talk to folks on the ground, they have a completely different relationship to it, right? They might not be using the word eugenics, but they understand what that means and they understand what that translates to as they're engaging with these different systems. Um, and, you know, um, for us, that was that was a huge discrepancy that as, as a policy advocacy org that really does um, work that is very community informed and as we're trying to involve folks in the policy process, that was something that was very important that we were constantly uplifting as we were speaking to folks in the Capitol and, and shaping what this legislation would look like. Um, and then I also wanted to, you know, um, uplift the fact that it's really important to, um, as you know, we, we talk about how we were able to really advance this forward and how we were able to secure reparations this year. Um, understanding the like global context of what was happening um, in the last two years, right? I think it's very much important for me, at least to like uplift the fact that 
conversation shifted on a global scale in terms of discussing white supremacy and calls to end white supremacy specifically and, and fights for racial justice, um, specifically the Black Lives Matter movement, how, you know, there, that really, like I visibly saw that, right, in, in the legislation as like conversations were shifting and there was suddenly, suddenly, right, and I say this because, you know, it's it's very it's very upsetting because folks have been arguing this and folks have been trying to say this for years and years and years and years, right? And um, it but also understanding how this global context really, I think there was no room for excuses that to a certain degree, right? Like folks had to listen in a different way. That um, really for me, it's important to center all of the work that happened on the ground beyond our coalition, right? That was happening to really shift the conversation um, and to make this. A possibility this year as well as you know there are definitely a lot of challenges with COVID-19 and at the same time it was even more critically important for us to make those connections right like who are the folks that are bearing the front of the pandemic in our communities are the same folks that have been targeted have been targeted historically for for sterilizations right and making those very clear connections were very very important especially at a time when the legislation that legislature was shifting where they were dropping all bills and saying they want to do absolutely nothing that isn't tied to COVID-19, right? And and what that meant for advocacy groups that are trying to have the legislation see the connections, right? That these things are connected. We can't see the crisis of COVID-19 in isolation, right? And they're very much connected to eugenic ideologies and values that are deeply entrenched into systems that, that is especially around like health inequity, right? Um, and so, it was very much a constant like shifting of messaging and things that we knew that our communities were very much experiencing like on the day to day, like how could we message that in the way that that the legislation would, it, you know, it would fit in their priorities, right? Because that's how it, these things, like how, that's how it works, right? Like they have certain priorities that they lay out for themselves. Um, and so, you know, really wanting to just elevate the gratitude that I know I feel for like everybody that really was involved in, in, in the advocacy over the last, for this iteration of the budget request the, um, and bill over the last four years, but even beyond that, like the incredible work that folks have been doing, um, you know, specifically Kelly Dillon over the last two decades, um, the work of, you know, researchers and everyone else that really um, were able to get us to this place now, right, where we had a strong case, where we had the information, the data, the research, um, the, the, the willpower um, of folks in our communities to really push this forward. Um, and then also uplifting, right, that for us, this isn't, it isn't over and it's, and it's by, by a long shot, right, like there's so much more that we need to do. Um, and also um, really wanting to, um, you know, just have continued conversations on what it would look like to be able to secure reparations um, for, for all folks that have been sterilized in different institutions, whether that be local, um, federal, um, private institutions, right? Because we know that there's much more nuance and complexity to that. Um, and so that I'll, I'll end my bit, but I'm really happy and, and thankful for the opportunity to share our work and looking forward to connecting with you all. Thank you so much for sharing all of that work and for all of the work that you and your organization um, have done. That it, it's just incredible to think about what happens behind the scenes when we know that these bills are these bills are passed and that there is some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and so, thank you for sharing that and uplifting everyone else along the way. Um, one of the things you said, I think, really struck me and leads, I think, to to one other question for you is that you know. It seems like it could the reparations bill might not happen because COVID-19 was the priority. But COVID also has really exposed these inequities in, in ways that have been, you know, needed for a long for a long time. And as you just said, it meant it made a space where people couldn't, you know, justify themselves out of it. Um, so now that some of these things have been exposed more readily to legislators, to policymakers, what are what's a what are some of the next step things that you all are doing at CLRJ to advance reproductive justice? Yeah, um, thank you for that. And so for 
for CLRG right now, um, specifically on the policy side, um, you know, we're definitely working on different issues. Um, what two that I think I really want to uplift. So for CLRG specifically, um, you know, we're part of a, another coalition that's um, called the Racism as a Public Health Crisis Coalition, and this really um, is centering specifically um, Black and Indigenous and other people of color that organizations that are trying to call on the state of California to declare racism as a public health crisis and to really um, call on the legislature to um, address systemic racism specifically. And while we know that there isn't like a, there's no clear answer on how to get us there, right? It's about making sure that the, that the state is first um, uh, committing funding to be able to do, um, do this work that's really censoring the organizations that are leading this work on the ground, right? Oftentimes with very limited funding. Um, and that's, I think, important to highlight, right? And so um, for us, you know, one of the things that we were working on in tandem like this past year was a, a budget request, another budget request to um, be able to secure funding for CEOs that are doing this work um, at a statewide level. And we, you know, received commitment from the governor to do something next year right, because of budgets and all those conversations but really um for us that's really critical as we center our reproductive justice work right because we can't we can't um have these conversations without um having you know pushing forward um work at an intersectional level and for us that's that's really a huge priority um another thing that i wanted to uplift as well is um you know, we have recently started um, doing community organizing more intentionally in, um, in Southeast LA uh, specifically. And um, one of the things that um, has been very much highlighted was the need to address the housing crisis through reproductive justice lens. We know that it's particularly, um, you know, mothers and, um, women and folks that are lead, leading families in like single parent households that are facing the brunt of um, the eviction crisis um, in California because of COVID-19 and beyond that, right? And so for us, um, we've been leading like local, um, a local housing campaign in Bell Gardens to try to um, secure uh, rent control and just cause ordinance. But for us, it's like beyond that, how do we expand this conversation, right, between um, reproductive justice and housing at a statewide level to really make those connections, right, because I think it's interesting, but, um, you know, as we're having discussions of reproductive justice in the legislature, you'll often have, like, RJ champions and, you know, senators and assembly members that are very solid on reproductive health and rights and justice issues, but are terrible on housing, and how can you, like, separate those things, right? Like you need to be, we need to have those conversations and discussing reproductive justice, very much addressing the needs of, of communities and, and um, through an intersectional lens. And so for us, that's a huge undertaking that we're really like in, in embarking on since these last two years, but it's a critical need that, that was very much like brought up by folks that we have been organizing with in Bell Gardens that we can't shy away from, right? And, and again, like all of these things for us are connected, right? Um, the fact that certain folks are really the ones that, again, are, are continuously facing the brunt of, um, of different types of inequities, whether that be health inequities, um, housing, you know, the housing crisis that very much is connected to folks' physical health, right? Like, and um, and so for us, that's, that's where our work is, is leading us um, next year. And then we'll see, obviously, you know, things, things shift and things are evolving continuously, but um, really trying to, again, make those connections for not just our community members, but to our representatives and to our legislation and really trying to shift policies that will hopefully have a, like a very much beneficial impact on our communities. And so, um, yeah, that's hopefully that answered your question, but um, that's kind of where our work is leading in the next uh, in the next few years. 
It does. Thank you so much for highlighting um, how how really inextricable ideas like reproductive justice are from other fundamental um, basic needs that people that people have. Um, wonderful. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. And I'm going um, to shift over to um, talk more specifically with Dr. Ed, Eric Red Rivera about the impacts and the issues faced by um, individuals incarcerated who come from indigenous um, homes and communities. And so Dr. Redner Vera, thank you so much for joining the panel. Um, and I'd love for you to share with us um, about how the issue of reproductive justice impacts indigenous women um, and especially those women who are incarcerated. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really inspired by the work that everyone is doing and happy to be in this conversation with you all. Um, so in thinking about that question, I wanted to take a step back because I feel like reproductive rights is just one symptom of how Native people in particular, women of color certainly, but Native women in particular are just um, dehumanized and have been undervalued and the violence against Native women that occurs. And so, um, so again, wanting to step back and, and thinking about how to address this question, I kept coming back to broader social justice issues for Indigenous communities and especially Indigenous women. And much of the larger society's perceptions, understandings, and awareness around indigenous peoples and communities is rooted in misinformation and stereotypes. Um, collectively, this their implications for social justice, contact with the criminal justice system, and certainly to healthcare generally and reproductive rights more specifically. I thought it was interesting in the film that the justification for sterilization or general lack of concern and empathy for what's happening to women of color in correctional facilities is that they deserve whatever comes to them simply because they're incarcerated. In particular, the idea, as was mentioned before, of a welfare queen kept coming up in the film. And to be specific, and again, as was mentioned, but just to highlight, a welfare queen is a term directed specifically at Black women to mean they're too lazy to work instead of relying, and instead rely on public benefits to get by, funded by hardworking taxpayers. The issue is that as social scientists, we know too that white people actually make up the majority of those receiving government assistance and many beneficiaries are actually working. However, negative stereotypes about people of color continue to prevail and remain powerful. This single stereotype reframed how poor black women and communities are perceived and ignores larger structural issues at play like racism and sexism. For native women and native communities, similar stereotypes exist, albeit in a different context. The federal government has forcibly reduced Native people to wards of the state, forcing them to rely on the federal government for nearly every critical aspect of existence in terms of land allocation, water rights, the ability to practice cultural traditions and ceremonies, and certainly this has implications for health care services. A considerable number of Indigenous people rely on federally funded government health care through IHS or the Indian Health Services, 2.2 uh, million respectively. IHS is significantly underfunded lacks qualified doctors, nurses, supplies, and supplies, which ultimately has direct and dire implications for quality of care and services. And so when we talk about reproductive rights for indigenous women and communities, it really speaks to broader social justice issues at play, steeped in colonization, genocide, oppressive tactics, and paternal treatment by the federal government, and really a general lack of concern for the value of indigenous lives and ways of being. And the research that I do specifically looks at how native people are sentenced across the criminal justice system, um, especially those who are incarcerated. Typically, this is the case because Native people are considered not statistically significant in research because they're a small percentage of the overall US population. Indigenous issues are overshadowed by systemic issues facing other Black and Brown communities. Um, and as I mentioned, ignorant stereotypes rooted in racism and misinformation fuel the national narrative about how Indigenous women and communities are depicted and ultimately feel how their fundamental human right to healthcare is further disregarded or denied. So all of that to say that I just, in it was really interesting watching the film and that just our general lack of compassion and concern for how incarcerated people are treated and we just devalue and dehumanize them. And so that, that's really at its core what stood out for me. Um, but of course this has broader implications for the BIPOC community and indigenous women and how their, um, just kind of relegated to the background, right? We don't really consider them and we just dehumanize them overall, so. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing up those, all of those specific issues. I think centering the experience of indigenous women, um, indigenous people who have been subject to, to these 
uh, to this colonialism, to this white supremacy, to this environment that that has created this continued oppression. Um, and so, in in what ways do you in what ways do you characterize or understand that imprisonment itself as placing limits on reproductive freedom or acting as a form of reproductive oppression? Yeah, so this is another really interesting question and one that to, to center it, like you said, around indigenous issues, because that's the work that I do. Um, I really think so for all people of color and indigenous communities specifically, the carceral system as a whole is essentially an extension of social control and government oversight. As a result of this micromanagement and oversight, indigenous communities who are already forcibly tied to the federal government are then further controlled and surveilled while in prison. Certainly access to adequate individualized care and cultural practices and reproductive medicines, remedies, and knowledge are undercut for Native women in particular. Um, scholars maintain that mass incarceration, mass incarceration by its very nature is designed to control and deal with inmates in sort of an assembly line manner. Therefore, it compromises and undermines individual decision making, autonomy over one's body and choices, and certainly has implications for overall reproductive freedom over incarcerated bodies. Um, aimed at indigenous people, systemic and institutionalized racism fuel this uh, lack of choice and autonomy Native women have over their own bodies while incarcerated. And as was mentioned, women of color and generally are disproportionately targeted. In particular, in, in kind of doing some background research in preparation for the panel, there's a study by Hayes and colleagues who argue that collectively this violates the most basic tenets of reproductive justice, the right to have a child, not to have a child, and to parent the children that you have with dignity and safety, all things that we certainly don't do or don't allow to have happen for those who are incarcerated. Um, by undermining motherhood and safe pregnancy care, denying access to abortion and contraception, and preventing people from parenting their children at all, and by doing so in over-policed, unsafe environments, mass incarceration has become a driver of forms of reproductive oppression for people in prisons, in jails, in the community. So more specifically, I feel like for Indigenous people, um, because they're already under such control of the federal government, that incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, these are just extensions of social control on this particular community. So again, it's not surprising that Native women, the violence that has occurred, has occurred against Native women and then things like sterilization where we're continuously uh, traumatizing this community and devaluing them in a number of ways. And that it's state sponsored and uh, federally funded. So. Sorry, excuse me. No, I think that that I think that that really resonates with so many of the things we viewed in the film, and then helps explain how this exists across indigenous um, um, experiences. And so, I think I think one more thing of interest is that in the film, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. In the film, we see and hear about this culture of secrecy. We see the staff kind of, for lack of a better word, hiding information. Can you speak about that as it relates to incarceration and then parallels with the federal government's role? Yeah, really quickly, I do wanna say my computer keeps telling me that Chrome is gonna update soon. So hopefully it doesn't do that right now and kick me out. I just wanna let you all know if that happens, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so this question I thought too was really interesting that just the, it's just the nature of the beast, right? The belly of the beast that, uh, that those in power want to remain in power. And so because we devalue and dehumanize incarcerated people, um, we build more prisons than we do build up communities and family, right? We, we put more dollars and money into building prisons than we do into social care type work, right? Um, and that there's this power differential in social status. What in particular, what really stood out to me is the gentleman in the film who was doing the investigative journalism um, he said, we have inmates accusing people with PhDs. Do we believe the crook or do we believe the quote, more credible person in this scenario? So this for me had, right, has broader implications about this social status so that we just automatically don't believe the crook inmate, um, but it doesn't really matter what they say because there's other individuals who are in power. So again, this social control um, aspect and especially for women in these vulnerable situations who especially kind of when there's this power differential you feel like um, you're just liable to believe the medical professional and you're not going to question kind of what they say or feel like you have limited options to question um, so so that's kind of a stat for me and kind of fueling this culture of secrecy is that those in power want to remain in power and there's just this dynamic of who has power and who does it in this power differential so Oh, I can't, you're muted, Kim. 
Thank you. I'm making sure I don't cough and then I just start chatting. Um, no, I'm, I'm really grateful for your perspective on that because I think that just, it really struck me. And I'd love to turn that um, part of that question back to Ms. Cohn, because you nodded your head when I reflected upon that particular quote from um, the film. And so I, is that something you'd like to speak on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've spent the past decade examining human rights abuses, including forced sterilization in California's women's prisons as both a volunteer legal advocate and as a filmmaker and have experienced the incredible levels of secrecy and privacy that these institutions hide behind, which make it so difficult to uncover these abuses of power and state-sponsored violence. And even in the position of power as a legal advocate. I remember one particular instance where I was trying to request someone's medical records, as you see in a similar situation where someone inside was not able to access their medical records themselves, which is a basic fundamental human right. Um, it took me two years to actually obtain this person's medical records after requesting them through both the, the uh, prison as well as the medical institution where they believed that they were sterilized. And I was sent back blank pages, wrong dates, repeatedly told that those records didn't exist. And finally, after two years, was sent a massive stack of medical records of all dates that then had to go through and be able to interpret all of the medical coding to then be able to give this particular person inside that level of information. So the barriers that they present illegally um, to not only folks inside, but their legal advocates is very profound. And kind of from the filmmaking perspective, to be able to get the statistic that you see in the film, 1400 sterilizations, nearly 1400 sterilizations were performed between 1997 and 2013 took years and years of requesting from the federal receivership, from medical institutions, from the prisons themselves. And, you know, even now going through this process and trying to anticipate what is going to happen a part of the reparations compensation um, for people, you know, we're, we're facing challenges and um, whether or not records are, are disappearing. So, um, this is a constant battle that I think all of us face and just really um, want to, um, you know, uplift everything that has already been, been said about how challenging it is to do this work, the human rights documentation work, when you are up against this David and Goliath kind of battle. Um, I mean, the Department of Corrections, the state is incredibly powerful. Thank you so much for that perspective and also for um, putting a little bit more context into how you even how you even collect that per, you know that set of information, I think we take for granted that now we all know that there are at least fourteen hundred women that you have chronicled. But the the labor that it takes to provide that is is incredible. <clears throat> and excuse me for um, this little hiccup that I'm having in my um, in my in my voice, but um, I would love to open it up to the room for questions. So please feel free to put questions into the chat. Uh, feel free to raise your hand using the little function. And while we wait for um, our attendees to put questions into the chat, I'd love to open it up to panelists to raise other questions or other points of conversation with each other um, about things that have been said. While we're waiting for questions, I would also just love to say that you know, even though we are in this David and Goliath battle, the film is really a story, an inspirational story for me. Um, you know, if you can see a, a group of activists and you can see now in the kind of post film, you know, activism that Lorena mentioned, you know, a coalition of groups coming together to create change, you know, with an amazing, amazing like solidarity across across the country with allies and across the globe. If we can go up against the Department of Corrections, if we can create change, I am hoping that all of you who are here today watching this panel are inspired to take one small action in your own community to challenge white supremacy. And yes, this is a challenge and this work is challenging, but together we really can create change. And I hope I hope you're coming away with that takeaway.
something I wanted to highlight too was how I, I, my goal and my aim in the work that I do in my scholarly work that I do is advocacy work because I feel like so we get siloed right as scholars we just kind of stay in our own lane but my hope is to build connections between people who are on the ground and doing the work and that we speak to each other because the work that I do on Indigenous communities there's so little research that this group has just been so um, as I mentioned, undervalued, we, we, there's very, very little research in criminology and criminal justice about how Indigenous people are treated. So I, I feel like the work that I'm doing is really groundbreaking and hopefully can speak to policy down the line. So it was just really inspiring, the film and the work that you all are doing on the ground. We do have a, um, a couple questions in the chat. Um, I don't know if people can see all of them, but one of them, I think, um, well, they might have just been sent to me. But uh, one question is, does Dr. Heinrich still practice medicine? Does any, if anyone knows the answer to that. He has retired. The medical board did investigate him um, and found none of the complaints um, to be valid. Um, so he faced no ramifications. But at this point, he is, has personally retired. Um, as a follow up to that, if you don't mind, Ms. Cohn, is that one of the um, elements in the film is the opposition to the bill was from the, was it the American Association of Obstetricians, I think, or American I College I, of Obstetricians. Thank you. <clears throat> um, that was shocking. Like, that was so surprising to me. Um, what, can you help explain or provide some, the rationalization for why the medical community isn't outraged, as outraged by this as others? I think it's important to note that ACOG has since changed their position and they dropped their opposition to the bill eventually, which is why SB 1135, um, you know, was ultimately successful along with other, you know, other um, organizations joining um, to support the, the effort to end um, sterilization for the purpose of birth control in California's women's prisons. It's important to note that that was already illegal to begin with. So this bill was really just a sunshine bill to highlight the already present illegality of the sterilizations. Um, the, I think, challenge with a lot of the medical community, and I should say a lot of the reproductive um, rights kind of activists, was the belief that everyone inside prison, everyone who is incarcerated, should have the same access to healthcare that people in the free world would have access to, not understanding that prisons are coercive environments and one should not be making major life altering decisions in this environment where informed consent is near impossible. And so it was really a process of educating ACOG and other members in the reproductive rights community that one, people inside were supportive of this bill and that the bill was written in collaboration with people who were inside and that this was not ultimately denying people healthcare. It was providing um, people inside with protection from their basic fundamental human right to family being taken from them. And so that was a big shift. And I think once, once people understood that, um, you know, they were able to kind of come around on their perspective. Um, but it's, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly challenging to understand things through that lens, a reproductive justice lens, um, and to be able to help, uh, help people get there. And I think testimonies, as you see in the film, Kelly's testimony and other people's testimonies um, from inside prison were essential um, in, in making that shift. Thank you for that. Um, another question that is posed is um, for you, Ms. Cohn, about, oh, I'm sorry, Jess. Sorry, can I just add one thing Please. to that? I think that's really, really important, the sort of the impulse to acknowledge the impulse to that everybody should have access to the same health care, I think is really important. And if that is something that's important to people, there are all kinds of struggles over access to health care that we could also get involved with for people who are incarcerated. Um, it shouldn't just be, you know, sterilizations and teeth extractions are, are like all you get. Um, but, <laughs> you know, people need access to hep hepatitis C treatment. They need access to cancer treatment. They need access to gender affirming care. There's 
all kinds of things that, um, you know, we want to make sure people have access to. Yes, agreed. Thank you so much, Dr. Rockcott. And I would also add to that, um, in addition to access, that when, when access is given, that it's quality care and that it's humanizing care um, and that, that people can really recover or be restored through, through health care they, they might be able to seek on the outside. So thank you for that. Thank you for that add-on. Um, <clears throat> so um, one of the questions is for Ms. Cohn about um, the most surprising thing you learned while filming and putting together the film, um, something you didn't know going in to making this particular documentary? I think oftentimes we think of um, prisons as retaliatory environments uh, for those obviously who are housed in these facilities, but we don't typically think of them being retaliatory environments for those who work there. Um, or perhaps don't take the time to consider that. And I think one of the one of the most challenging aspects, I mean, there were so many challenging aspects of this film from behind the scenes kind of funding to reporting to um, challenges surrounding access. Um, I think uh, I became desensitized to the like to the shocking nature of everything throughout the process. Um, but circling back, I, I found it incredibly challenging to be able to find medical professionals who would be willing to speak on camera on the record about what was going on. And it actually wasn't until we were nearly finished with the film, we actually thought the film was done, that I was finally able to speak with two nurses on the record about um, what had happened and what was going on. And you see there are two different perspectives in the film, but so many people were afraid of, of speaking out even though they were no longer employed there. They were afraid of retaliation. They were afraid that their pensions would be taken away. And so it's, you know, when we talk about the culture of secrecy, it is so pervasive, um, you know, inside and the retaliatory environment is so pervasive. It's so systemic. Um, for those who are employed as well as those who are um, housed in those environments. Um, and then I also just wanna say some of the challenges surrounding access. I don't know if this was surprising or shocking, but going back to the kind of initial question, the challenges surrounding access in order to be able to tell this film in a very visual way actually presented a tremendous opportunity to reimagine how we visualize imprisonment. Um, oftentimes we are exposed to um, prisons um, in overly dramatic, sensationalized, hypersexualized depictions. Um, we wanted to really reimagine how we visualize imprisonment using you know, imagery that conjures the notion of informed consent that really evokes um, you know, the passage of time and memory and place and then furthermore, to really place audiences into these vulnerable, uncomfortable spaces, what it would feel like to be handcuffed to a gurney, being wheeled into a surgical operating room, what it would feel like to have your legs dangling from an exam room table where you sit completely naked, waiting to be seen by the doctor who is employed by the prison where your daily existence is threatened by force. There is no choice of medical professional. There is no second opinion. There is no Googling a medical condition. And so really understanding this environment and the coercive nature by using imagery to place audiences in that environment was essential. So I think that challenges surrounding access actually provided creative freedom to do something very different. Thank you for that description. I think um, you absolutely accomplished that presentation um, about bringing a, a, a very nuanced and important visualization of prisons that most people and probably most of the students in our criminal justice program don't often see. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple questions for any of the panelists, so please chime in. Um, uh, coming from, um, I know is one of my students, uh, we see in the film a lot of fear from what happened to the victims without their knowledge, as well as the fear of speaking up because of uh, repercussions, which you just mentioned. Um, what are some of the ways that um, 
women who, or people who have been victimized in this way can speak out about what happened to them? What are ways in which makes people comfortable coming forward and sharing this kind of trauma um, across your all's experiences? Um, I'll just start from a kind of technical perspective of where we are in the process um, of the reparations um, kind of next steps. Um, if you are participating in this panel and you suspect something has happened to you, um, you are welcome to reach out. If you go to bellyofthebeastfilm.com, um, uh, there is a portal for survivors um, where there are additional resources that you can find. Um, so I will, I will address it from, from kind of a logistical where we are in this moment perspective and let others chime in as well. I'll post the link to, uh, in the chat. Do any of the other panelists have a response about, um, how to support people coming forward who fear those repercussions? I guess I'll just say more broadly, it's uh, sharing stories, right? The fact that this film exists and that the word is out there and hopefully people um, that feel connected to it that maybe don't realize like was mentioned in the film, don't know something happened to them. That storytelling is so powerful and maybe they're, you know, advocacy groups and uh, mental health in particular that they have the resources to um, cope and deal with what's happened. I know Kelly, and she said in the film that her story is her own and that she gets to decide when she tells it. So I think that respecting the space to, to, to survivors, you know, to when they feel comfortable and ready to speak up, that hopefully there are those resources there for them. I, I will say too, I think this is responding to the question, but um, there's a lot of shame around and there shouldn't be, but I know that a lot of people sometimes have shame about things that are done to them, state violence and coercive sterilization. And even if they know, it might not be something that they've even told their family or, or friends or other people. Um, and also there's a lot of shame and stigma around being a formerly incarcerated person. And so I know a lot of people uh, try to pass or 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 not 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 discuss that they don't want that um, experience to you know shadow people's perception of them or or you know um, way that they would be treated in the world and so I think that we have a lot of work to do as a community to like create safe safe spaces for people to come forward with their stories um, and to know that they will not be judged or criticized or blamed for what happened to them, that we want to lift up, lift them up um, as survivors um, and, you know, as, as, as people who survived something that wasn't their fault. And um, so I think that that's on us as a community to create an environment where people can come forward with their stories. Yeah, thank you for all. Just, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. No, yeah, I just wanted to echo, you know, what everybody else um, has already mentioned. And also in terms of um, next steps, I think a really important piece as well is um, for specifically the eugenics um, population of survivors that we are trying to outreach to, which will be, will look, the process will look differently than the notification and outreach that's going to be done for folks that um, were sterilized while incarcerated. But we are, um, you know, going to be doing a pretty big outreach push um, next year as we're trying to uh, locate um, and identify survivors. And so specifically um, for any um, folks that have access to spaces that provide services or support, for people that have disabilities um, or, you know, um, particularly older populations um, that you know, are low income, um, any type of like um, 
uh, su uh, suggestions or folks that may be working in these types of spaces, we really appreciate the support as we're doing outreach next year. Um, because again, like I, I know Erica has mentioned, but this is a pretty big undertaking to try to reach as many survivors as possible in both populations, right? The folks that were sterilized under the eugenics, um, like the eugenics population, and then also um, folks that were sterilized while incarcerated as well. Thank you everyone for, um, for all of those comments. Um, I think one more question, um, actually for just two questions from um, folks that are that's in the chat and it's really about, it's really about the system. So one of um, the attendees remarks, um, I have a question about the doctor seen in the film who performed the sterilization on Kelly and many others. Uh, Erica mentioned that he has since retired but faced no reprimand. My question is how? How has that person faced a reprimand? Which goes along with another question about, are there checks, are there um, processes by which systems do engage in, in, in vetting individuals? And if not, what kinds of processes could we imagine or what kinds of things should we imagine to help make that change? Yeah, I just wanna um, say that he was not reprimanded, he has retired. Um, so he was investigated by the medical board, um, but no actions were taken against um, Dr. Heinrich. I should also say that it wasn't just one doctor. You know, the um, Kelly's doctor was uh, different than um, Dr. Heinrich. Um, there were multiple doctors over multiple years. The procedures didn't actually take place at the prison. So there are layers and layers and layers of approval that need to happen in order for someone to have a surgical procedure. So for example, you know, someone would get um, referred from the from the, the doctor, the chief medical officer would have to sign off on, on it, that person would have to be transported um, with approvals from that particular institution to a particular medical facility. And then the consent would be obtained yet again by the physician and medical staff at that particular institution. So there are layers upon layers upon layers and the federal receiver, you know, who was brought in as you see in the film to oversee healthcare in California's prisons because the healthcare was so deplorable. The federal government is complicit in this as well because they were paying for these procedures. So when we, when we talk about, you know, it's not just one it's not one bad apple, it's the, in, it's the entire system, it's systemic. It is so deeply entrenched. Um, and I also wanna say that, that these procedures took place at 23 different facilities across, um, across California, including two teaching hospitals. And we've actually in some of our Q and A's had um, had medical students attest to experiences where um, they witnessed um, something like this happening, so. Wow. That's incredible to hear. Um, any other comments from the panelists about this, this structure, these layers and layers of bureaucracy that are, Im are implicit in this experience? Um, I guess I'll say from a criminal justice perspective, our justice system is flawed in many ways, but the brunt of the, the burden falls on the defendant, right, to prove that they were victimized, to prove that something happened to them. And so when you, one, don't maybe don't have the words, you don't even know that something happened. And then two, um, it, the, the systemic, right, like we talked about, there's this whole system up against you. It just feels, it can feel, I would imagine, overwhelming. And so I think that just play, our justice system is flawed in many, many ways. And it's it, a lot of the times, unfortunately, is not um, in terms of it, it. We don't put enough emphasis on advocacy work for victims and survivors. Right. So. Yes, thank you for that, Dr. Brenda Vera. That is, um, I think, goes to that question. And one thing that came to mind when you said that is I've. I feel like having done this work, at least in the academic and community-based organization setting, uh, our knowledge of it is shifting, but our action of it perhaps has not shifted 
yet enough. Um, and so I thank you to the calls for action from each of the panelists, um, as you've discussed all of the parts related to what we experienced watching this film and what we've experienced hearing you all speak about. Um, we have just a few minutes left and I would like to um, open the floor one more time to our panelists for any other closing remarks or things that they wanna be sure they share with our audience before um, we finish our panel discussion for today. I was wondering if um, Lorena would share info on how folks might get involved with CLRJ or like join a listserv or get more information about some of your campaign. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, I can maybe share my email in the chat. Um, folks are, you know, if for anything that we mentioned today in terms of um, suggestions on um, organizations or places that support with outreach or just getting involved um, in any way, please let me know. I also want to uplift that we have a, um, a chapter in San Diego, actually. Um, it's the Latinos for RJ chapter, and um, our chapter leaders are very much um, uh, integrated a lot into our policy work. Um, and so we're, you know, if folks are interested in that particular space as well, um, you can definitely uh, contact me. And I'll put my uh, I'll put my email address in the chat. So thank you so much for that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I cannot I cannot express enough gratitude for the opportunity to have convened this panel for the support of Dr. Watcott and Celine Joseph at the WRC for helping bring this together and for all of the panelists. Um, bringing each of these perspectives and this background knowledge. Um, and many thanks to you, um, Ms. Cohn, for producing this film, for bringing this story um, to our sphere so that, that we can continue to spread this, um, this knowledge and this information and this experience to the broader, the broader sphere. So um, with that, I, I welcome any remaining questions or comments to stay in the chat. We can collect them and disseminate to the panelists, but I, um, I'm grateful to all of you who've attended, who've watched the film, um, and I look forward to more dialogue around this particular issue. I also just want to thank our interpreters today, and sorry we weren't able to connect with you before the event, and thank you to our captioner. Thank you so much for that, Jess, absolutely. All right, well, terrific. Thank you again for everyone um, for their time and their energy um, and just for being here. And we look forward to um, encouraging this conversation as we move forward. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.